welcome everybody to this panel on where music meets tech. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel for you of experts from right across the music industry to talk to you about developments in technology and how the music industry works with tech companies. My name is Jeff Taylor. I'm the chief executive of the BPI and the Brit Awards. Now, the BPI is the trade body for recorded music in the UK. Uh, we've got the three major labels as members, that's Sony, Warner and Universal Music, and about 450 independents, including labels like PS, BMG, Demon, Cherry Red, etc. And our job is promoting British music. Uh, we do that by running the Brit Awards, running the Mercury Prize, we co-own the charts, we run the certifications for gold, silver, platinum. Uh, we run a government-funded grant scheme called the Music Export Growth Scheme which has given out about four million pounds to nearly 300 British indie artists to promote their music overseas. And we're right on the front line of ensuring that artist work is protected. Uh, we've removed almost a billion links to copies of British labels, music and artists, uh, music uh, from search engines. Uh, so we're very busy on that front. And we represent uh, our industry to government and in the media. So that's our role. Uh, and today I'm joined by three fantastic panelists. Uh, we have quite a, quite a diverse set of speakers. First, we have Emma McGann. Emma is a British singer-songwriter. Uh, she's a prolific user of social media, both for live performances and for promoting her work. Uh, and we'll be hearing a lot from her about how she uses technology day to day. We have Paul René Albertini. Paul René is the CEO and founder of Marathon Artists, which is a British independent label. Uh, but uh, as well as working for independent uh, sector, he's previously been president of Sony Music Europe and of Warner Music International. So he has a, a, an enormous experience across the record industry worldwide. And his label represents uh, a great range of artists, including, for example, Courtney Barnett, Pond, Baba Mal, Max Jury, Hazel English and Honey Blood. A marathon group also has great depth in uh, Afrobeat music and in British jazz. So tremendous experience. And our third panelist today is Chaz Jenkins, a very experienced executive who is Chief Commercial Officer at Chartmetric, a music analytics platform. And prior to that, has set up and worked at various independent labels and uh, also worked uh, at a major label as well. So thank you all for joining me, fantastic panelists. Um, we're gonna start by looking at the landscape and thinking a little bit about how technology has influenced the music industry. Um, if one goes back to, to 2010, um, music streaming back then, which is now obviously uh, very, very popular, but it only accounted for 3% of recorded music revenues uh, in the UK. And by 2019, that had increased to 70% of sales revenues. So streaming has become the dominant form of consumption, the dominant revenue driver for the business. In fact, last year in the UK, we saw more than 100 billion streams uh, from consumers for the first time. And the, the market continues to grow very quickly. That grew about 7% last year. But obviously we've also still got ownership. Uh, people are still buying CDs, but it's fallen from about 120 million in 2010 to about 35 million last year. So we're seeing this change in model from ownership to access. Uh, but at the same time, people value collectability. The LP has gone from strength to strength. In fact, it's risen from 234,000 LPs sold back in 2010 to 4.3 million last year. So there are people who love to stream and they love to purchase as well. Uh, so that's the kind of recorded music landscape writ large. Um, promotion and discovery have changed dramatically too. We've seen uh, the globalization of the music industry through global platforms such as Spotify and Apple Music and a lot more personalization in terms of the way uh, that people consume music. So those are themes that I'd like to pick up now in our discussion with the panelists. So uh, perhaps I could go first to Chaz Jenkins. Chaz, you know, uh, Chief Commer Commercial Officer for, for Chartmetric, a, a data analysis company. Um, how do you find that, that technology has influenced uh, the business and what do you see in the data that you analyze? Sure. I mean, the, the, we talk about growth. We've already, you've already mentioned, Jeff, the growth of music in, in the UK and the growth of music consumption, but that growth has taken place globally. And, you know, traditionally, if we wind back 10 or 20 years, we used to think of a music industry which, which involved basically 30 countries around the world. Most record companies were only really concerned about 30 countries. because That's where, in general, you could actually make money by selling music. Um, today, music is available in 200 countries around the world. 
And so the potential audience for music has just exploded. And that's been driven by streaming. And, but also, you know, the, there's a huge amount of data created by all these interactions which uh, take place online on, on um, streaming services. And that is transforming our, the insight we can, we can get about the music industry and helping us identify opportunities in the marketplace. In the UK in particular, we've always been successful at breaking international artists. You know, the UK used to be fab a fabulous place for launching artists, homegrown talent in the UK, developing a blueprint and then taking them to the world. Um, and the, but today it's almost the opposite way around. Artists these days often build an audience first and foremost internationally, you know, because there are, it's so easy now to consume, to distribute music globally and to find music from anywhere in the world. Thanks, Chaz. And Emma, I, I guess, you know, you've lived this experience. This is your day-to-day -day life using technology to promote yourself around the world. How does that work for you? So I'm a full-time live streamer and have been for the last uh, almost seven years now. So a lot of what I do day to day is actually uh, a large part of it is interaction with the fans, sharing music in that format. And probably about 10 years ago to this day, uh, I was, you know, uh, not doing this. I was uh, touring around the UK, getting as many shows as I possibly could on a shoestring, you know, I was uh, really doing that kind of slog uh, with little to no money, trying to study at the same time and uh, trying to find a fan base uh, at that point. Uh, and there was a day where I thought, okay, there has to be an alternative way to do what I love and do it where I'm actually making some form of living from it. Uh, and around that time, so many friends around me who are artists themselves, I saw those people struggling and I just thought there has to be a different way. Uh, and that's when I discovered live streaming. And uh, one day in the back of the tour bus, I did an hour's uh, live stream. And immediately afterwards, the stats we got back, um, I kind of saw that conversion rate of, um, you know, people from the live stream going over to social also going over to actual the like purchases from the merch store and we had more interaction and a higher conversion rate in that one hour live stream than one week maybe even two weeks of uh, of touring so i remember being sat uh, in the tour bus at that moment thinking okay there's definitely something to this and i pursued it um and it grew into something um incredible where I found myself you know growing an audience like you say worldwide not necessarily just locally and all of a sudden my audience are kind of sporadically placed all throughout the world and for me um, the US market in particular kind of blew up uh, quite drastically um, and as an independent artist over the last um, decade it feels like there's definitely been a significant shift um, 10 years ago, I think touring around uh, the UK, you know, I go around with physical albums and I'm really happy to say that like the physical albums seem to still be in demand for my audience even now. Um, but yeah, there's definitely been that shift. I mean, f in the independent realm, you know, artists like Chance the Rapper who have excelled brilliantly from an independent point of view, artists embracing, uh, you, know, you know, kind of recording music from their own home without having to hire out a studio, for example, Billie Eilish has really championed that and you know I feel like younger generations of artists are seeing um, independents do so well and in looking to see how they can embrace tech in different ways and so no, live streaming no. for me really was that kind of avenue. And so you've been using it not only to grow your fan base and, and connect with fans all over the world but also to earn money from from virtual touring and tipping etc. Uh, so the technology is not only helping to sort of grow your business but also become an important revenue stream for you. Now, turning to Paul Rene, Paul Rene, you've got so much expertise in breaking artists around the world. Uh, and I know now with Marathon Artists, your label, you're doing an incredible job across different genres, whether it's indie or whether with your other labels, it's Afrobeat or British jazz. How are you using technology to build global audiences and to develop your artist careers? Well, in a nutshell, if, if I had to describe the landscape, uh, from the, uh, I mean, the music, recording music value chain, from the creation, production, to the consumers, uh, yeah. that value chain has changed a lot. The entry barriers are not the same they used to be even 10 years ago. So if you put it in three blocks, production, exposure, 
and monetiz consumer facing monetization, uh, you, the, the, the biggest change is that the last two have merged. It would be like if in the old world, the radio, TV and press were also owning HMV. So you, you kind of, uh, you know, have to deal with that. So the good news is that everybody who has something to say to express can do it. So the first break, creation, expression of your art is the very low entry bar here. You can do that, everybody can do that. And that's and the, the, the beauty of uh, all this generation coming up. The second, uh, I would say the two bricks uh, which have merged uh, are now so complex, so difficult to deal with and sometimes full of contradictions internally that we believe that artists still need some help to do that. You know, people will tell you, well, an artist needs a manager, a good manager, and then they can do their way. I, I, I do appreciate that. You can start your music, you can, you know, start to touch the first circle, but, uh, you know, even if you give to that Emma to communicate and to share, uh, at certain stage, to get global, the level of complexity has, uh, you know, increased exponentially. So that's why I do believe uh, there is uh, a room for a record label, a team that would help the artist to go through that complexity. So that's the, uh, the new recorded, you know, business, uh, recorded music business in my, in my mind. And the relationship is very different accordingly because the artist, they own the thing. So you do partnerships, you do kind of joint ventures or services and stuff. So that's the new, if you will, the, the, the new way the record label is now operating uh, globally. Well, that's exactly right. So the music business is becoming a tech business. Uh, data analytics is at the very heart of it. That's the service, Chaz, that, that your company provides. And artists, Emma, you know, are looking at all that data and using that data themselves to craft their careers. Let's look specifically at the position of, of the British artists and the br British music industry. We've got this incredible heritage of success. Uh, in nine of the last 15 years, the top selling artist album in the world has been by a British artist. We're one of only three countries that are global exporters of music on a net basis. And we're still breaking international artists, whether it's Dua Lipa, Harry Styles, Lewis Capaldi at the moment. We've got this incredible record, uh, obviously going back through Ed Sheeran and Adele. So we've got a tremendous record of building superstar artists, but I think it's getting tougher. And from the data that we're seeing, uh, local music is becoming more important. It's getting harder for British artists to punch through on these global digital platforms. And in fact, we've seen the UK share fall from around 17% back in 2015 to around 10, 11% at the moment. So the competition is getting more intense. So what can we do? How do we support British musicians to get a biggest possible share of, of a global market that is growing very fast? Emma, let me come to you. Well, uh, for, for me, one thing that has hu hugely helped me in terms of export is the MEGS funding. Um, so I was awarded the um, MEGS award um, almost two years ago now. And I. So sorry, applied... I mean, this is the music export growth scheme funded by the government yes. that gives out money to independent artists to help them promote overseas. Sorry, please go on. Correct. Yeah, and I initially applied um, to tour around the US uh, to bring the live shows stateside for the first time to that US market, um, as that's where the majority of my listeners were based um, off of the back of the live streaming. So the aim uh, was to tour hotspot states uh, around uh, the country, but also to make the tour um, not a one trick pony. Um, it was important for me to add an element in there where um, I could ensure that it would turn into something self sustaining. So I could go back the next year and tour again. That was really important to me. And also uh, to, to ensure that um, we were doing some form of virtual live stream element in there as well, um, off the back of my live streaming profile. Um, so, and for a UK artists wanting to tour in the US, that is no easy task and certainly not a cheap one at that. And uh, the MEGS funding uh, actually enabled me to secure a visa, book the venues, you know, gain significant press um, in Rolling Stone, Forbes, and lots of other things. Um, at, Obviously, COVID has bumped us, uh, unfortunately, but because we actually did some research and development with the funding as well, uh, and also worked on the tech side of my website where um, the virtual live stream element um, enabled us to do virtual shows and kind of open, um, open the scope geographically where more people could almost attend certain shows of the tour, um, 
it made it easier to pivot um, this year. So I've actually been able to continue the virtual side of that tour. And um, thankfully, the uh, profits we've made off of that have uh, covered any losses we've made for postponing. And we're doing the physical shows next year. And really without the Meg's funding in place, um, as an independent artist, um, you know, that really wouldn't be possible. That, that's great to hear and that's exactly what Megs is there for, to support emerging artists and help them develop on a global basis. Now Chaz, coming to you, I know something that you've done a lot of work on is looking at the influence of particular cities in growing fan bases around the world. So perhaps you could explain uh, more of what your data shows. Sure, sure. Um, the, the starting point, I suppose, is to look at digital services. We often think of digital services such as Spotify, and Deezer and YouTube as the modern proxies for record stores. But really, they've got much more in common with social networks. And, you know, they use popularity algorithms to identify th things which are trending. If something reaches a bigger audience and the audience likes that, they promote it even more. And that's, a con that's common from social, traditional social networks like Instagram through to services such as Spotify. And so in a sense, it's really important to reach a big audience in order to grow your audience. And that engagement is really key, especially for a market such as the UK. You know, we've been fantastic at producing global stars in the UK for many, many years. But in terms of the online population, the UK represents less than 2% of the global online music consumer population. And that's a, it's very difficult to tip the scales when you're only sort of appealing to a very, very small audience. And so, and things are just developing organically anyway. People discover music organically, um, particularly because of that very low point barrier of entry, which Paul Rene mentioned. It's so easy these days, literally, for kids to record music in their bedroom and within 24 hours release it globally in hundreds of countries. That was never possible in the past. And what we looked at was we looked to try and identify the places in the world where audiences picked up on artists at a very early stage. In the past, record companies would try and break artists in their home market before launching them to the world. But what we were finding was that uh, audiences in specific countries seem to, you know, find artists really, really quickly and then share them very, very quickly with their friends. And artists grew out of, you know, really a relatively small number of places around the world. And I'll show my screen. Um, hopefully that has come up. Now, initially here you have um, in green the 30 countries which were really the traditional markets for music globally. And if I change the slide, um, what you see here in light green is these very viral markets. The, the, the orange dots are what we call trigger cities. And how we compiled this map was to look at 50 artists who at the beginning of 2017 were very small unknown artists. And by the end of 2018 and into 2019, they were global stars. And among the artists in this list, you know, 80% of them were British and American. They included the Billie Eilish, they included Rex Orange County, you know, they included BTS, a big range of emerging artists. And we looked to identify the 10 cities where those artists got their initial engagement and grew their audience. And you know, what we found was despite the disparity where most of the artists were coming from the US and the UK, you know, these artists were building audiences in other countries often on the other side of the world before they were really building an audience in their home market. You know, particularly cities in Southeast Asia and Latin America are really, really viral. You know, incidentally, the top two cities are Jakarta and Mexico City, neither of which are markets which really the music industry paid much attention to in the past. Well, what's and, interesting, Chaz, sorry to interrupt, but what's interesting is that, that those markets that you're talking about are very much where we're seeing uh, strong growth for British artists. And the predictions are that the global recorded music market is going to grow tremendously from about 22 billion now to about 45 billion by 2030. So there's huge opportunity out there. And these are the countries that we need to be targeting. Uh, with our music, yeah. if we're going to grow, you know, if we're going to grow those revenues back. So this is fantastic intelligence. 
Yeah, it's, you've got to remember the populations of these markets. There, you know, a country like the Philippines has twice the population of the UK. And people in the Philippines love music. They listen to music all the time. And crucially, most people in these countries use social media in a different way to the way in which we use social media in North America and Western Europe. We don't really share content that much, whereas 80% of the world shares content. They sh if their friends like something, they share it with their other friends. Now, can I bring in Paul Renee? Because Paul Renee, you are an expert uh, taking uh, independent music or niche music, such as British jazz, and, and bringing it to a global audience and finding these hotspots where there's interest in that music. So what lessons have you learned and, and how else do you use technology in pursuit of all those uh, niche markets around the world? Well, to the point of having the, the UK, that uh, this heritage in the UK to produce and to push for the world global artists and global success is there, is still there. Because the level of creativity, the level of, uh, I would say, the agility of the business in the UK to push and to support music is there. I guess where, where we, are we going to play the difference or not is with technology. As Charles just explained, uh, tech is the key, is the answer to your question. Uh, at Marathon Artist, we, Marathon Music Group, we do have labs uh, yearly, we have cohorts. And you know, this year the cohort is about AI and how to support music discovery. And that is precisely what, you know, Charles was explaining. I mean, the uh, USP, unique selling proposition of the UK music industry has to be, uh, you know, comforted by a strong tech know-how, a strong tech support. That's the way. Because as Charles showed on the, on the big map, the level of complexity grows exponentially with the number of users and the information from those users. So if you're an artist, even someone who, who knows their way beautifully and amazingly like Emma, and you, 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 you need to figure out, uh, you know, how to expose your work, to share with people your work uh, in this level of complexity. I promise you, even if you're super, super agile, you, you need some help, you need some support. So I guess the, uh, the real added value that could be, you know, brought at that stage to maintain that UK heritage of global music is the ability to support the tech that's gonna help the, uh, this creative scene. So you mentioned jazz. I mean, something's happening now in the UK. I'm not sure everybody's aware of it, but there is a, a, a revolution. This is not a niche, this is a community. Uh, artists sharing things and having a very different approach to how to create and share their music. And uh, uh, I think if we should help them to monetize their art, and should help them to push it throughout the world. And for that, tech is key, as a for instance, and I, I know at the BPI you do a lot of these things, but at the moment we have the labs working on some of the you know, jazz projects to echo the jazz creators uh, all over the world. In all the uh, cities that uh, jazz has shown, you have people echoing something happening with the London jazz scene at the moment. So our job as a, as a record label, New Gen, is to make sure we are, we are able to put this together and to, from the UK, to help these people to grow globally in impact. So a jazz, for instance, a new award with a new component of a jazz award could really keep on having this UK USP to show and send music throughout the world. Well, you know, I, I think that's the heart of it, Paul Renee. The UK does have this opportunity. If we can embrace tech more effectively within our creative companies, than our competitors so that our record labels are not only the most creative, but the most innovative. Uh, that is what will help us uh, take the most of this opportunity. And I think you've just given me a new idea for a Jazz Mercury Prize uh, that I clearly should be, should be working on. We'll talk about that offline. Um, we've been talking a little bit about uh, the future uh, of, of tech and how that's the direction of travel for the recorded music business. And it's much more based on data, as Chaz was saying, than it ever has been in the past. Let's, let's do drill down a little bit more into that future and think about what technologies there are that are gonna help us shape the future. I've been interested, Emma, that you know, you've talked about kind of virtual touring and, and we've read a lot about this with COVID. 
Um, clearly, no one's been able to get out there to a real venue, so more and more artists have been starting to, to use uh, virtual tours and even potentially get paid for it. Can you tell us more about how that experience has worked for you and what you think the next steps are and what other technologies you might be able to embrace as an artist? Sure. So you are essentially looking at my venue right now. This is where I host all of my um, my live stream shows. And um, the great thing about the live streams that I do is that they are monetized. And as an artist, that is my main source uh, of income. And that comes, it's a direct to fan uh, kind of interaction, which uh, from a monetary point of view is fantastic, but also uh, from an interaction point of view with my fan base is fantastic for me as well. I think, um, it's uh, obviously important in this moment more than ever that artists are able to monetize shows, uh, particularly from home. And, you know, the tipping system that a lot of live streaming platforms have integrated already. And a lot of the uh, social platforms, um, bigger social uh, giants that are, are now integrating that, such as Facebook stars um, that have recently just come out. I think uh, it's kind of opening the scope in how, how uh, artists will be able to monetize their virtual show content. Uh, looking towards the future, I think uh, virtual shows uh, are going are gonna to just continue to thrive in years to come, whether they be hosted uh, on artist websites, like how I've done my virtual tour, uh, on live stream platforms, or uh, even, you know, in game on a stage in Fortnite. We've seen artists do that recently, which has been really interesting to follow. Um, and I think we'll see just in general, a lot more artists balancing live shows and live stream shows. Um, much like the format I had planned um, originally for the US tour. And to me, that makes sense because it makes the music and it makes the live show way more kind of geographically uh, accessible, um, particularly if you're streaming uh, um, on platforms that already facilitate artists and facilitate active communities around music. Um, so if you're already catering to your local uh, audience, you know, when ven venues are actually open in the future, um, then why not ca cast the net a bit uh, wider and, um, and continue to do uh, virtual shows as well. And another thing I'd say is I think I can kind of foresee that there'll be a lot more um, kind of uh, partnerships with labels and games in general um we've seen uh, obviously fortnite do a lot of uh, a lot of kind of in-game concerts and i just feel like there's more kind of um scope there for artists in a discovery sense um whether that that's um you know a sync licensing thing or whatever i think we're going to see more partnerships in that field of things too so i know you've no used uh, you now uh, a lot uh, emma also is, has twitch been a big platform for you and do you do you think twitch has more potential uh, for artists uh, to reach an audience? I think uh, both platforms have uh, an incredible uh, potential. I have just started using Twitch in the last year, actually, and both have um, really vibrant music communities and really driven uh, supporters. Um, it's evident to see over the kind of seven years I've been a live streamer, you now has been, you now is my home. It's where I kind of uh, honed my skills as a live streamer. It's definitely a different skill set to being on stage, uh, but both uh, offer a completely, um, a completely different way of interacting with the audience and earning as you go and you know it's not necessarily just slimmed down to music it's also a balance of uh, personality driven content as well that um i feel audiences uh, really look uh, to consume we're talking about you know uh, you say the audience over in the philippines they're sharing content more than more than anyone and i feel like um having that insight into artists lives beyond a tweet or beyond just a photo on Instagram I feel like that's really really valuable and that's what um that's what platforms like you now have been able to uh, help me do just uh, connect with that audience that little bit more thanks Emma and I, I know this is something you've looked at chairs what lessons can we learn from artists in some of the cities uh, and countries you've talked about who are really doing this well and what skills do we need as an industry and as artists to make the most of these new platforms? Sure. Um, we, we talk a lot about the concept of 365 marketing. You know, in the, in the old days of the music industry, the marketing effort used to be very heavily concentrated around the release of an artist's album. So, for instance, you know, your typical marketing campaign would start one week before an album was released and last for two weeks, or one week if the shift figures were bad. 
you know, and, and literally, and then after that, there was an assumption, yes, the artists would go on to, to try and keep the album alive. These days, artists are always on. You know, it's not, it's not just a battle for consumer acquisition. In the old days, you know, we just needed to encourage people to go into a record store, hand over 15 pounds and walk out with an album. In a sense, that was job done. Every, every, the artist was monetized. Today, it's much more a question of retaining constant engagement. You need your fans to listen and listen again. And ideally tell their friends and grow an audience. So audience, acquisition, audience retention is as important as audience acquisition. And that's something which, you know, artists, strangely, are really, really well placed to do. Artists and their management, they work 365 days a year, I'd hopefully with some holidays and some weekends off as well, so they don't go insane. Um, but it's, you know, it's at that point where it's really critical that we grow and retain audiences and learn audiences and use the platforms where consumers are. You know, consumers, um, you know, particularly if you look at the gaming sector, you know, gaming is fundamentally changing. For us, for people of my generation who grew up with um, Sonic and um, Street Fighter, games today are very different. They're more ecosystems, they're more environments where, where the players are often, are often creators in their own lives. And so these are places are opportunities and that's where our consumers live. Really interesting. So I'm sure you've encountered this poor and a through Marathon Labs with the startups uh, that you've been working with. I, I, I'm interested as to where we go next. Clearly, virtual reality is something that already a lot of artists uh, have, have uh, played with. I think you have, Emma, a little bit. Uh, but what about artificial intelligence? It's already embedded into the streaming services. We talked at the beginning about personalization and how you know, recommendation and, and, and the, the way we use these services intelligently influences what is presented to us. But artificial intelligence is also something that artists will use and that labels will use. So Paul Rene, what are your thoughts about its role or any other new technologies and how they're gonna influence the next 10 years for the recorded music business? Well, to, to, you, you said it, Jeff, that the, uh, the AI uh, has to be seen as uh, one of the new tools available for creators to you know push out their work it's not instead of creativity it's not just a new instrument it has to be seen as a new instrument it's it's here to stay anyway this is the way the only way you can manage through uh, such a volume of information of data all over the planet so if you want to build something you need to have the tools and if you want to create something you also need to have the tools in order to do so so I, I guess AI and, uh, well, the last labs, uh, uh, the current labs we're running, the cohort uh, uh, really says it all. We have Museo, we've got Sunite, Know What's Loved, you know, UK company, MySphere, Remixology, three UK company out of the five. So my point before was uh, there is already in the UK uh, the level of, uh, I would say, expertise for this uh, technology to flourish and to keep on supporting the UK music heritage. And uh, the job, I get, our job is to make sure that we, we make this happen. You know, a small country like Sweden has, uh, you know, created uh, three or four of the biggest platform ever on the planet. It's not because they have a large population, isn't it? It's a, it's a cultural thing. And I guess in the UK, we do have that music cultural added value. And so to, to mix it with tech is something which is there for us to do. And, and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the champions, but not the only one. And I'm sure there are a lot, lot to be done. It's already in motion. That's the way to keep on being global and to keep on you know, using the, 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 the... Because whatever was said before, uh, the, there is still that uh, amazing creative, uh, uh, you know, material people tradition here in the UK. So how do we serve it? That's the, that's the point. And if I may just add a, a quick thing to what was said before about the artist cycle and the artist marketing, how to, uh, you know, promote, push, help an artist to make their living and their career and find their audience. Clearly, the cycle has changed. You have to produce more uh, and you have to be, uh, keep on going permanently. However, it's not only that. You have to find a way to, for, to become a recognized brand. The brand is not the right word, but if you see what I mean, an artist needs to have a name, 
to have fans which are not going to evaporate next day. So they come and check the artist on stage and, uh, and, they, and they come and they, they look at the live stream, whatever. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, this is where the marketing exercise becomes difficult and the UK has to develop an expertise in that. How do you go from stream volume to, you know, branding, creating, you know, the next big names of the industry? And that, that is the new marketing, you know, question mark. And that is mm. what the added value could be of us being actors here of, a, of that industry. Thanks, Paul. Now, well, at the BPI, we take very seriously uh, you know, the need for labels to embrace these new technologies and to try and take advantage of the global opportunity. I thank you, Paul Renee. You've engaged with our Music and Tech Springboard program to try and bring the, the tech sector and startup sector and the music industry closer together. And you're obviously living that every day with Marathon Labs. I wonder whether you guys think, you know, with your experience, Paul Renee, I know you've applied for and had MEGS funding. Emma, you've had some MEGS funding. Um, do you think this is something where we should be pressing the government to extend that scheme and to apply it to things like virtual touring? Uh, Chaz, you were, you were you know, referring to some of the cities where there's great potential. I think we've seen most of the MEGS funding directed at the United States, directed at North America, a little bit at Latin America, but mostly Europe and America, really. Um, our view at the BPI is the opportunity is in places like the Philippines, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, etc., and we need to support our artists with technology in getting to those uh, markets. So do you think that's something we should press the government for, that they should support um, with more money for, music, for the Music Export Growth Scheme, for more territories using technology? Yes, um, I agree. I think it would be hugely beneficial, particularly for um, newcomer artists that, you know, might not have um, big teams behind them and might not know how to navigate uh, themselves online or incorporate tech uh, to kind of, you know, like, like I say, cast in there a bit, a little bit wider. Um, I think it would be hugely uh, beneficial and, um, you know, I, I it's it's a part of the it's all a part of the process for me in terms of learning the ins and outs of how we do this how i do it next time and things like that it's definitely been a learning game for me uh, and um the independent kind of realm has where where i've kind of thrived because i enjoy uh, navigating things uh, on my own and learning things for myself but for um newcomer artists that might not have that drive i feel like um a kind of technology focus would just uh, be amazing and i feel like that is uh definitely a route that is going to open out a bit more in terms of the virtual uh, shows in the future so yeah i think it could be hugely beneficial thanks and i think i think it needs to happen really really early the time for art, the time when an international growth for an artist is going to be most valuable is right at the very start, when artists generally have the least resources and the least experience. You know, there's a there's a there's a curious effect that these um, popularity algorithms have in social networks, where if something gets popular in lots of places really early on, it will grow in other places as well. But often if, if an artist becomes really popular in just one place, then they're almost locked into that one place for eternity. So it's a curious effect of the way personalization works, uh, popularity algorithms work. And so really this sort of funding, this sort of support is really critical. And where you see other, where other markets or other industry players have really supported artists in this way, in particular with Korean artists, where you know Korean management companies automatically try and get exposure for their artists in the entire Southeast Asian region from day one. It works and also in Latin America and where again it's a much more integrated market and artists from Colombia, Brazil, they try and get exposure in lots of other places really early on and it's no coincidence that you know over the past five years the two most consistently successful um, solo artists come from the Latin American region, from Colombia and Puerto Rico. And the biggest band in the world today, they're from Korea. Well, that's absolutely right. I mean, the market is globalizing in that sense, in terms of repertoire sources. And I think British music, we've got that heritage you were talking about, Paul Rene, but we also face much stiffer competition, I think, not only from the algorithmic effects you're talking about, Chaz, which is if you have a large population, like the United States, 
you've got a, a, an inherent advantage in the algorithm that's present, potentially going to get you better playlist placement and more promotion on the platforms. So yes, you need to work even harder if you're from a smaller country like the UK to, to break through. And there are countries where uh, artists and labels are, are working, working the algorithm really well and promoting themselves really well digitally, like K-pop, for example, has done an incredible job. And as you say, artists from Colombia and other Latin American territories. So we feel we need to step it up. That's exactly why uh, we're asking the government to double the MEGS funding and to, to allow us to target more of those markets. Feels like the UK is in a good place. We have a great opportunity uh, to grow our music business. You guys have given some great thoughts as to how we can go about doing that. I think our time's just about up, but if I could invite each of you, uh, one or two sentences, anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to add? Jazz, do you like to start? Um, yeah, it's the, you know, we fear data. There's, there's an inherent human sort of facet which sort of like fears data, but all of this data which we talk about and algorithms and personalization, they're really just computer algorithms which are just replicating human decision making um, to grow things internationally, to grow, to, to introduce new audiences to new things that people will like. And so we shouldn't fear this growth. We shouldn't regard it as any sort of threat. It's an opportunity which we should be embracing. Okay. Thank you, Chess. Emma? Um, yeah, I would say if you're uh, an independent artist in particular, you need to be harnessing technology in every way possible. Um, you need to apply for the MEGS funding. If it weren't for harnessing technology and also the MEGS funding, I wouldn't be an independent artist that is now making, you know, a six figure sum. And I wouldn't be as comfortable as I was back 10 years ago when I was sat in that tour bus. So harness technology, apply for the MEGS funding and good luck. Perfect. Thanks, Emma. And poor Renee. MEGS funding were very helpful. We had two cases, Jimmy Isaac and Afrobeat. And in both cases, it really literally blasts them out and help a great deal. So yes, that's uh, something which is extremely helpful. Support to tech is key. Uh, sorry, I repeat myself, but mm -hmm. as a conclusion, I think the, um, the, uh, the PPI is there already at work to help. And uh, you, you can see that the uh, UK USP is there. So uh, tech and also how to monetize the artist's work through that tech, because that's, that's a subject we haven't been touching upon, but uh, artists need to make some you know, they need to make a living. So that's, that's also part of the mission. But having said that, thank you Absolutely. very much. Well, I suppose there's this new term, Createc, which is getting used in these conferences a little bit. The music business is a perfect example of a Createc business. Creativity meets innovation. That's uh, how we create culture and how that creates trade. I'm really grateful to all our panelists today. You've done a fabulous job. And I hope everyone who watches uh, enjoys, enjoys the panel. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.